I did, some of my interviews were unusable because I said, uh-huh, uh-huh. <laughs> or even worse, because I could be heard typing uh, as I was conducting it over the phone for fear the recorder wasn't working. Um, and I learned to t record interviews over the phone. There are a number of uh, apps that you can use to do that. Um, Lesson number five, your podcast can reach more people than your print stories will, though with luck, people will be drawn to your news. Subscribe, get smarter, and save democracy. One of the reasons uh, podcasts are so popular is that they're easy to take in. Reading takes concentration, free time, and pay attention. Podcasts, on the other hand, are a multitasker's dream. You can binge listen while you're shoveling snow out of your driveway on a cold New England morning or sweating on the elliptical or bailing your hay or sitting in your windowless cubicle pretending to cold call Taekwondo teachers for the profile. Some 40% of Americans have now heard a podcast. Uh, we launched the podcast simultaneously with the written series. The idea was cross-fertilization. The series would drive people to the podcast, maybe for the first time. Uh, say, maybe for the first time, and the podcast would drive people to the stories on the website and maybe introduce them to some of the other journalism that we do. And with luck, people would subscribe and start getting their news from sources more reliable than Facebook. <laughs> and, you, and that would promote the cause of news literacy uh, because we are facing a crisis of Credibility, after all, according to a Reuters Ipsos poll, just 48% of people have confidence in journalists. Uh, by the way, only 51 means are safe and 47% believe in haunted houses. Um, can half the country that doesn't trust us be reclaimed? Is it a good idea to write them off as unreachable? Uh, I think the only way you can even begin to win the other by crook to start reading the paper. I don't think podcasting is going to save American newspapers. I don't think that serial narratives, which is the other thing I do a lot of, uh, are going to save us either. But I do think that they are potentially a couple of great weapons. Lesson number six, you need to be aware of the cat. As a print reporter, you don't have to think about the cats and the dogs or other animals in the room where you're doing your interview except to worry about whether they will act, uh, act. The first time I interviewed Tara Newell at her apartment on tape, I asked her to please put her cat in the other room. Uh, I am allergic. We talked and we were about an hour in and we were slowly building to the most sensitive part of the interview where I had to ask to tact her. This is an emotionally raw experience for her and she is getting choked up. She's talking about grabbing the knife and killing him. And just then, her cat loses its mind. <laughs> it's through the door, as if it senses her distress in reliving this moment. I didn't realize how bad it sounded until I played the audio, and the producer said, this is the most important part of the tape, and it's pretty much unusable. So what do you do? You can't eliminate them altogether. You can preempt the listener's questions and tell them, uh, you're about to hear a cat, try to ignore it. <laughs> or you can ask her to read it. Did. I explained that I was a total amateur, learning as I go along, and could we please redo the whole thing? And we did it all over. Lesson number seven. Lesson number seven. It doesn't have to be about you as fascinating as you believe yourself to be. S-Town and Serial, the really ambitious podcasts everyone talks about and wants to emulate, are very much about the hosts, Brian Reed and Sarah Koenig. Like them both, they're, uh, the hosts are characters in it. They're central to the story. You're on this journey with them. Their sleuthing is the spine of it. You get their reactions to every turn of the story, and they are surrogates for the audience. Uh, they are penny pale imitations. The idea with Dirty John was to marry the rigors of real narrative journalism reporting to the radio serial format. And one thing I wanted to prove was that this particular story could be told without turning me as writer and host into a character. 
the way I've always written my newspaper stories, which is by staying out of it and letting the people it's actually about do the talking. It's constructed as a story in the classic sense with a beginning, middle, and end. It has scenes. It has characters facing choices and conflicts and danger. And in that crucible, I wanted to do something uh, kind of in the tradition of In Cold Blood or the classic Gay to Lee stories I grew up with or The Staircase, the documentary series about the murder case, uh, where the filmmakers are basically invisible or give the illusion that they're invisible, though they're pointing the camera and controlling every. So maybe in the next podcast, I'll be more of a character. Maybe my presence will feel organic. But here, I'm basically a window pane through which people can see the events unfold. Uh, you may have heard the Onion Stellar podcast, A Very Fatal Murder. Uh, you, if you haven't, this is about a New York reporter investigating a murder in a small town. He likes to talk about how he went to NYU and tells the dead girl's parents how much she would have liked it to. Um, <laughs> Some people have told me the onion is making fun of me. Uh, I don't really believe it, but if it's even 5% true, I'm flattered. Lesson number eight. Uh, you have to earn people's attention, but you don't have to surrender basic journalistic principles to do so. So the word entertainment doesn't necessarily have great connotation. Journalism with charticles and listicles and gifs or lowest common denominator, titillation and exploitation. I think there's a tacit assumption among a lot of people in this business, or some at least, that to be legitimate, a piece of journalism has to be a little boring. At least uh, they equate gravitas and seriousness of purpose with tediousness somehow. It doesn't feel properly ennobling unless you have to suffer to get through it. Uh, in unguarded moments, they will say, I like the story a lot, I couldn't put it down, but doesn't that make an entertainment rather than journalism? I remember a Washington Post reporter uh, talking about a conversation with one of her editors who told her, you've buried important data findings beneath a lot of pretty writing. To my mind, the dichotomy between entertainment and journalism is a choice. It all depends on what kind of entertainment you're talking about. I submit that even in hardcore investigative pieces, good writing can invest you in the human impact of the findings uh, way more than a series of bullet points might. Um, my hope is that Dirty John is a public service. Uh, it tells a story about domestic abuse, and it layers, lays bare the wiles and stratagems of a sociopath on a granular level. It demonstrates how it is possible to fall prey to a malevolent creature like John Meehan and how it can destroy a family. It portrays the phenomenon, which is a subset of domestic abuse that doesn't necessarily involve violence, but involves intimidation, isolation, gaslighting, which are lies made to make you feel insane, and micro-regulation of a victim's day-to-day -day life. The abuse monitor every email you send. They may hide your phone or tell you how to fold the towels or iron the socks. They go on social media and pretend to be you and ruin your reputation. Now you can write an ordinary feature about coercive control and furnish it with uh, illustrative and a fine and worthy story. Or you can try to go deeply into one family's experience with a compelling narrative and try to tell it from the inside of that experience and bring it alive. And the lesson, I think, will be immeasurably more powerful. The series I did depicts domestic abuse in a way that doesn't punish you with statistics and the disembodied pontificating of a lot of experts. It does so in a way that I hope does not bore you to tears with the weight of its importance. Here's the thing, there are now endless entertainment and information and your finite attention. Some of you are college professors with captive groups of helpless students, and you can force them to read The Fairy Queen or the collected works of Thorsten Veblen. But in most contexts, you can't make people listen to what you want them to listen to just by telling them it's good for them. That is often the tacit pitch made by big important newspapers, by the way. Read this 30,000 word series because it's good for you. You feel guilty and you have to pretend to have read it to fake your way through the water cooler conversation. You want people to read your story and listen to your podcast because they feel guilty if they don't. You want them to love it so much they commend it to everyone they know. You have to earn people's attention. Lesson number nine. You are not going to be murdered if you fail to podcasting. They said, Gofford, have you ever written for radio before? 
I said no, but I didn't write a book until I did either. My motto is your comfort zone will kill you often. If I'm not terrified of what I'm doing, terrified that I'm going to fail miserably because I'm way out of my depth, that doesn't seem worth doing. If you're not failing at some things, you're not trying enough things. And every time you succeed, your circle of possibility expands a little bit. I'm always trying to lash against the outward edge. It's only worth doing if catastrophe seems a real option. Some of the sentences in Dirty John are 40, year, for, 40 years long, 40 words long, which I was advised not to do because it's not conversational. Uh, that's the orthodoxy. My friend, over a cup of coffee, you're not supposed to use big words and cultural references that aren't instantly grasped by everyone. Uh, and I tried to push back against that a little bit because why does a 16-year-old's frame of reference have to determine what I put in? Least culturally curious listener in America. So I snuck in a few long sentences and some references to Don Draper and Citizen Kane. And if listeners don't know what Mad Men or Rosebud are, uh, they can look them up. It would have been very easy for me to say, I can't write a podcast, I'll leave it to the ants. You might be able to get away with some things. And if you get very lucky, the Onion will do a satire of your work and you will feel that you have arrived. Uh, lesson 10, it's all about the story now and always. It's all about the story now and always. This is the real reason Dirty John found an audience. Please note, I didn't say, it's all about the content. Don't know when this bloodless and depressing phrase started taking over the world, but I never liked it. I don't care if people call me a reporter or a journalist or a newsman or an ink-stained wretch, but I bristle at the label content provider or cringe-inducing phrases that make writers feel like assembly line workers at a dog food plant squeezing glop into a tin can. As a kid, I idolized Ernest Hemingway. I didn't say I want to grow up to be just like that hard-living, two-fisted, bullfighting. It's like telling the person you love, let's get married and make some little carbon-based life forms. <laughs> the Sudoku puzzle is, there's more. The Sudoku puzzle is called content, and the daily horoscope, and the item on ways to braise your pork. But so is my colleagues reporting on the victims of the Las Vegas massacre, or the Montesino mudslide, reporters on our foreign desk who risked their lives to get or my colleague David Willman's investigation into how the Pentagon paid Boeing $2 billion in bonuses for a missile defense system that doesn't work, a story that uh, the Los Angeles to get, or my colleague's jaw-dropping revelations about what's been going on at USC, uh, which are still coming out, or any of the important work done by a thousand reporters around the country every day. The term content is akin to what they say in Hollywood where they describe books and stories as IP, which is short for intellectual property. A commodity like cattle stocks that salesmen can make a buck on. So writers are just interchangeable IP purveyors, valuing of what writers and reporters do. It conflates Woodward and Bernstein with the wordy gurdy. It puts a tweet on the same plane as the sound and the fury. Why am I cranky about this? <laughs> may have followed the fortunes of my newspaper over the last few years under the heel of a charming company that was going to cut a third of the staff and shutter the DC Bureau and bring in a shadow staff in LA and implement a bizarre plan where creatures called entrepreneur contributors would supplant actual reporters and turn out a lot of clickbait. This would have destroyed us as a newspaper. But that sort of corporate thinking is only possible when the newspaper is basically conceived of as a content receptacle <laughs> so that the faceless employee drones are there to, to, uh, to fill. Uh, by the way, we're in a better place. Denton Community Television, operated by the Mayborn School of Journalism, the University of North Texas.
to the newest edition of Chatting with Chumbler on Denton Community Television. I'm Neil Chumbler, Dean of the College of Health and Public Service, or as we call it, HPS, at the University of North Texas. It's from our Department of Public Administration to talk about the exciting things happening in their department. First off, we have Dr. Brian Collins, Chair of the Department, joining us to tell us more about the great things happening. Welcome, Dr. Collins. Thank you. So I hear you have some exciting news in regards to rankings that came out recently that we're all really proud of. Talk to me about that. Well, the U.S. News & World Report has ranked our MPA program number five in local government management and number four. Super excited about that. And that's the result of a lot of hard work uh, from our excellent faculty, from our excellent students, and from our outstanding alumni. That is such great news, Brian. Can you tell me more about our Master's in Public Administration program? Our MPA program trains business in governmental and in nonprofit organizations. So we have concentrations, for example, in local government management, nonprofit management, uh, emergency management, public finance, and a new concentration in data analytics. These students go on to be city managed nonprofit organizations as executives and as fundraisers and even in the private sector or in state governments and even the federal government. When was the UNT's MPA program established? The program was established in 1961 and we have about 1,400 alumni. Student enrollment is about 162 students. About half of those students are traditional students who have just completed their bachelor's degree and the other half are students who are mid-career and are seeking credentials so that they can uh, improve their career path. And there's also a PhD. Talk about that. We have a PhD program in public management and public administration. We have about 35 students in that program. It's a four-year program and we have um, specializations in local government management, nonprofit management, and public finance. To be scholars and teachers in the university context mm -hmm. and we have students who are placed in um, state schools such as the University of Mississippi, University of Idaho, Utah, and, and many others, up to and including the World Bank. Tell me a little bit more faculty in your department. Well, our faculty are strong both as scholars and as, and as teachers. They all care deeply about their students, and that's one of the reasons we have such good relations with our alumni and such long-lasting networks. But we have faculty, for example, Simon Andrews in network analysis. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's a study which looks at how organizations have to work together to solve very complex situations and problems such as emergency response or even the provision of local goods and services. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Bob Bland published the fourth edition of, of his well-known textbook in local government budgeting. Dr. Lisa Dickey has just published her fourth edition of a textbook mm. in nonprofit management and she's currently studying how nonprofits collaborate with other organizations to deliver of, of, of many of our excellent faculty. Tell us about our alumni. What types of careers do they end up having? We have about a 70% placement of our alumni in local government, um, and, and the rest are in nonprofit and other governmental positions, as well as the private sector. We, uh, nonprofit CEOs, we could do the uh, Dallas North Tollway tour. We could mm -hmm. start at Dallas and see that the city manager of Dallas is T.C. Brodnax, who is an alumni of our program, wow. just go right up to Israelson, is uh, the new city manager there. He's an alumni of our program. And then just go next door to Frisco, and um, you can uh, meet Ron Patterson, who's the president mm -hmm. of the Frisco Economic Development Corporation. So our alumni, especially locally, have a tremendous community and upon the lives of everyone who lives and work, and work here. Is there anything else you'd like to add about the, your department? Our department has excellent students who have big hearts and who are uh, ready to change the world in a, in a very positive way, and they have the skills to do so. They have the skills um, to do the technical analysis, and, and they have the skills to bring all that together uh, in a manner that will actually um, be profitable and useful for our communities. Thank you so much for joining me today, Brian. Thank you research happening in the department that will have far-reaching effects on homelessness and criminal recidivism. Plus, we'll hear about the new undergraduate programs in public administration that will prepare students for careers that will make a difference. And, passion,
for public administration from the walls of UNC out into the Denton community. Welcome back to the show. Meet Dr. Abraham Benavides, Associate Professor of Public Administration, a $400,000 grant from the Texas Health and Human Services Commission, and he's here today to talk to us about it. Welcome to the show, Abraham. Thank you. Thank you for having me. First of all, this grant is a collaboration across the college, correct? That's correct. It's uh, a combination of criminal justice and rehabilitation and health services. The co-PI on the grant is Dr. Chandra Carey, who also serves as the chair of Rehabilitation and Health Services. May I, may I also yes, add that, <laughs> that the, uh, we have a wonderful team that we put together. She's our senior program coordinator, Orhan uh, Islamabhav. He uh, works as our postdoc. Mm. And we have two uh, PhD students that also work in helping facilitate a number of different issues that we have. So it's a great team, yeah. and everybody works together. Received it, but I think it was all of us received mm -hmm. it together. Well, that's yeah. wonderful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us about what the grant entails. Sure, I can do that. If I can just step back a little bit. Mm -hmm. In 2013, the state of Texas, the legislature, you know, uh, provided some funding for something that they call, and basically a healthy community collaborative is a network of organizations that work together to provide services for the homeless. Uh, that uh, funding was strictly for urban areas. It was very successful, and therefore in 2017, to expand that program to serve rural counties. Mm. And our particular role uh, for this particular grant is to create something that we're calling a learning community. And that learning community is an opportunity for us uh, to train for those that are serving the homeless. What work have you done on the grant so far? A lot of work, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> one, uh, one of the things that we've done, when, once we first uh, received news, we conducted a needs assessment, individuals that were signed up for the program, as well as others that we have brought into the program, and uh, tried to find out exactly what is it, where their level was mm -hmm. of understanding of uh, what a healthy community collaborative was. Uh, one of the other things that we've provided is with subject matter experts within the college. Mm -hmm. And these subject matter experts are helping us create modules or training uh, opportunities in recidivism through criminal justice, in health and uh, rehabilitation services. Mm -hmm. They were providing workshop on mental health, you know, and also substance use. You know, in public administration, we're looking at in general, um, homelessness, and also sustainability. Once we've got a healthy community collaborative mm -hmm. going, how do we keep it going? Counties will you be working with on this project? Yeah, initially when this program started, the state gave us six counties with their associated partners that they were gonna work with. We have now increased that number to about 25, and we're hoping to be able to increase it more. Uh, it, it able to provide this learning community an opportunity for them to know how to be able to provide these services. So what do you hope to do with the results that from this project? Yeah. Although the, the grant, as in most grants, has an end date of June 2020, mm -hmm. you know, a standard report, here's what we did. Uh, for us, as we're looking at this, this is a project that is greater than just an end date. You know, this is an opportunity and we are establishing a foundation so that going forward, we will have the opportunity to continue to community collaborative works. Mm -hmm. uh, but at the same time, we're also developing uh, three academic papers uh, mm -hmm. to inform our academic colleagues on what we've been doing. Informing and training the community, sure. but at the same time, informing and letting know our academic community what we've been doing. Is there anything else you'd like to add about the project? I think I, I would. There's one thing I'd want to say. Right now, in the news, we, we hear a lot about the homelessness, homelessness issues chosen a particular model on how it wants to address it. It's a holistic model in the sense that it's looking at a number of issues that a homeless individual might encounter, but at the same time, it's in the individualistic. The services that it provides go directly to that individual. And so I know different people can try to address Mm -hmm. the issue of homelessness in a number of different ways. But we believe that the model that Texas has chosen, you know, is the one that's going to address the issue, address all of the issues that they have. Just one example, 
uh, we are looking at a housing first model. Therefore, when an individual comes in for services, regardless of the other needs that they might need, we provide housing for them first. Once that housing is their housing, now do they need substance use issues mm -hmm. or do they need employment issues or do they need recidivism issues? And so all those come in secondary after they have their housing. Mm -hmm. And so basing, using this model, we believe, is a better way to address the homelessness problem. Mm -hmm. You bet. Thank you. It sounds like you and your team are doing great things with this yes, project. Yeah. We're excited. Thank you. Okay. All right. Coming up, we'll learn more about the new undergraduate programs in public administration. And we'll hear from the student who was planning to pursue a career as an EPS. Find out what made him change his mind and choose our new degree in urban policy and planning. I'd like to welcome Dr. Laura Keyes, lecturer and undergraduate program coordinator for program to the show. Thank you for joining me, Laura. Laura is here to talk about our new undergraduate programs in public administration. First off, Laura, tell us about the newest degree program, the Bachelor of Arts in Urban Policy and Planning. Thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. So it's a very exciting opportunity for students in many different interest areas, including public policy, geography, environmental science, to use their creativity, their analytical thinking to help create community in the sense of designing spaces, uh, designing, uh, creating parks and open spaces, uh, giving input and design ideas to infrastructure and mobility in our community. So very many different facets of community function and design. Place for us to launch this new degree because of the rapid growth that mm -hmm. we experience in this state. Uh, it gives uh, a chance to have a population of professionals that will give input into the identity and sustainability of our places. And it's also been a website by the Bureau of Labor and Statistics that this is one of the fastest growing careers. What types of classes are offered as part of this degree program? Well, we are providing students with the fundamental skill set to design communities. And so our course classes in demography, mm. in um, urban and regional planning, so introducing them to the history of cities, to the theories of planning, uh, as well as land use and transportation planning, methods of urban planning, and then also students are going to be able to participate in a problem with a city or a community. So what are some of the careers that someone with this degree can pursue? There are really a broad range of opportunities for someone to apply a degree in urban policy and planning, zoning offices or even in building code, as well as the federal and state government both have important responsibilities in environmental protection, in the construction of our uh, highway and freeway system, but they are consulting firms that te te technically are mm. consultants to cities uh, yeah. to help them complete their work, uh, but also private developers that are building the communities in which we live. So there's a wide range of opportunities to pr pursue a career in urban planning. Let's find more information on this degree program. Well, certainly they can always contact me directly and uh, through our office in the Department of Public Administration. They can reach us through our email at uh, upp at unt.edu. We also have a Twitter feed at UNT Urban Plan students to follow us for the latest details about events and course offerings and guest speakers. And then they can also, uh, this isn't to reach us directly, but a real great perk of being an urban policy and planning student is that they get free membership in the American Social Professional Association for Planners. Hmm. Now there's a, another fairly new undergraduate degree program in public administration, the Bachelor of Science in Nonprofit Leadership Studies. Tell us about that. Well, this is a real exciting opportunity for us to be able to offer the, you know, there is a real growth in the nonprofit sector. There's over 23 million nonprofits. In the state of Texas alone, mm -hmm. there's over 98,000. The nonprofit sector is part of our three sector society and accounts for 5% of the GDP. Uh, their executive director mm -hmm. all the way down to volunteer manager mm -hmm. and administration um, and operations positions within the organization. So what types of classes are offered in this program? So our focus is to provide the operating 
nonprofits. So they are learning proposal writing, foundation, uh, foundation development, fundraising, philanthropy, volunteer management, program evaluation, community development. Uh, we believe, we know when working with the sector and understand types of critical core competencies that they need to have in order to be successful in this career. Now you've touched on it a little bit before, but what types of careers does someone with this degree pursue? Again, we, we want to be a degree that is open to a broad range of interest areas for students. You could be interested in the arts and work in museums. You could be interested in uh, health and or addiction and rehabilitation and work for nonprofits uh, that are addressing those specific issues. You may be more focused on advocacy mm -hmm. of certain issues like environmental awareness or climate change. So you don't have to know, you don't have to identify with a specific area. We're going to help you match these skills with your passion. I understand you have an advisory board for this program comprised of some pretty worlds. Tell me about that and how the board is involved with this degree program. We are so grateful to have the commitment of some amazing leaders from the nonprofit community on this advisory committee. They are providing important uh, direction for us on curriculum, helping us understand just changing dynamics and needs of the industry, and we're able to respond to that by uh, enhancing aspects of our syllabi for the coursework so that we can make sure that they're career ready. They're also playing an important role in providing that practical experience in this career trajectory that they are on. Mm -hmm. So they're doing that in multiple ways. They are being the leaders uh, at the forefront and in providing internships for us that meet our needs for management and operations. And they are also coming and giving that personal touch by mm -hmm. being profit networking events. They're being guest speakers in their classroom. They're just providing that opportunity for students to share their business cards and build their employment network. How can students learn more about this program? Um, certainly, they can uh, check out our website. They could all time. Our email is npls at unt.edu. Uh, we also have a Twitter feed for our nonprofit degree, which is np underscore unt. And so there are many ways that they can reach out and learn more information about our degree. Is there anything else you'd like to And by just reminding students and uh, those interested in the degrees that both of our, our BA in Urban Policy and Planning and our BS in Nonprofit Leadership Studies uh, also prepare students uh, that would may be interested in going on and seeking a degree uh, through our Masters of Public. Thank you so much for having me. Sure. Coming up, we'll talk to a student who is considering a future as an architect about what made him change his mind and choose our new urban policy and planning degree program. Here to talk about the difference she's making right here in Denton. Welcome back to the show. HPS prides itself on student-centered learning that prepares our graduates with the skills needed to judge and join the workforce. I'd like to introduce you to Adier Aranda, a senior in our new urban policy and planning program to give you an idea of his experience. Thank you for joining us today. I in understand you have an interesting story about how you ended up. Sure, so directly after high school, I attended a major four-year university um, and pursued architecture. I did three years of architecture. And the more I got involved with it, it was for me. So mm -hmm. it wasn't about designing spaces specifically within buildings, but designing spatial relationships with cities or how, how do like perhaps a park interacts with like a downtown? What does it do? What does it bring? Like concepts of space and like occupying. Um, I applied it, started to apply it in a bigger, broader sense. So eventually I just started taking like classes that I wanted, like history classes, uh, environmental, sustainable and eventually it just kind of fizzled out. Um, and then six, seven years down the road, I was uh, here on campus um, visiting and I literally saw a sign, which was maybe a sign, <laughs> uh, <laughs> about the new pro. Wow, this is, this is great. Um, it actually, it, it makes sense because it, it DFW is one of the fastest growing you know, metropolitan yeah. areas in, in the country. And it makes sense to have an urban policy and planning degree offered here 
mm -hmm. and um, to the advisor's office, the IE was like, hey, I'm not even a student. Um, I, I, I want to know more about this program. And, you know, a week later, I got accepted. I applied, I got accepted, and, and here I am. That's a fascinating story. What interests you m most about the... Just like the personal level of, of complex issues that urban areas and cities to have and, and the, the solutions on how to address whether they, uh, the, the problem. How is your experience? It's been really great. The faculty is awesome. Um, the um, concepts that I've, I've been learning are, are, are really interesting. Um, it's a lot of the same language of, of what I've learned before, and it's, it's just the uh, application of, of those concepts. You touched upon a little bit, but tell me a little bit more what you're learning in the classes, the concepts you were mentioning. Yeah, absolutely. So in one of my classes, I it teaches about uh, policy analysis just in general, so mm -hmm. how to go about if there needs to be an approach. Um, and um, I, I mean, I've been learning also about like how cities have grown, um, you know, things such like the Federal Highway Administration and how that impacted, you know, the America in the, the mid-century along with like um, you know, post-World War II efforts. Um, but it, it's, it's um, I'm, st I'm starting to bridge a lot of the concepts mm -hmm. that each class has and relate to it big picture and it's, it, it's there's an overlap. I think that's really, really cool. And I think that's important because there's a lot of overlapping things that, that, that you know, cities, cities uh, deal with. What do you hope to do with your degree after you graduate? So I want to go into transportation planning. Mm. I am in love with public transportation for that it should be run efficiently. Mm -hmm. And that's what I want to go into, um, whether it be working with a specific city, whether it's working with a uh, public transportation company or what have you, or if it's simply consulting is where my heart is. Is there anything else you'd like to add about your experience with the program? Uh, no, I mean, it's it's great. Uh, I love it. I, I wish I would have taken more classes, honestly. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't want to go too far in because, you know, I'm like a returning student. But um, no, it's it makes sense. It really does. Like, I'm glad it's here. It's, it's, it's needed in, in the DFW area. Well, thank you for being here out of year. We can't wait to see the difference you make in this world. Thank you. Thank you. Coming up, we'll talk to an alumna about the impact she's had on I'd like to welcome Rachel Wood to the show. Rachel is the Deputy Director of Development Services Facilitation for the City of Denton. Thank you for joining us, Rachel. First off, tell us a little bit about what you do for the city. So my role, it's a new function and a new division within the city of Denton, and development facilitation is really focused on two things. One, as a developer comes in with a potential project wanting to develop in the city of Denton, they have some customer service needs, so we have identified facilitators back from, I have an idea for a potential project, all the way through to getting their certificate of occupancy and actually being able to, to use the facility that they've built. So my position is focused on improving customer service for developers, improving transparency for the development process. This is where right now we may have some customer service issues because our processes are not as streamlined and efficient as they could be. Prior to coming into my current role, I served as the chief of staff in the city manager's office where I managed special projects, managed the city council agenda process, and was the primary your journey in public administration. What was your first job upon graduation from UNT, and how did you get where you are today? Sure. So my first job upon graduation from UNT was I was an international local government management fellow for the city of Savannah, Georgia. Mm. Um, and from there, progressed as a management analyst in the city of Savannah, Georgia. Then I became an assistant to the city manager in a city in South Florida, Lake Worth, Florida, which is a suburb of Women's Manager for the city of Charlotte, North Carolina. Then became a budget analyst in the city of Charlotte. Was then promoted as um, the strategy manager, which is a position that's focused on process improvement and performance management. Is manager in Charlotte, which is very similar to a chief of staff role, and then um, accepted a position with the city of Denton as the chief of staff and now the deputy director of development services over facilitation. That's an impressive career. <laughs> 
How has your degree from our program prepared you for your current? I am today. If I hadn't gone through the UNT MPA program, made the connections that I made in the program, as well as had the internships that I had. So had I not gone to UNT, I wouldn't be working for the city of Denton today because through the UNTA MPA program, I met Mario Canisarger. He played a vital role in me getting my, my first job with mm -hmm. the city of Denton. And then uh, John Nelson, who is a UNT MPA alumni, mm -hmm. who was in my class, works in our human resources department. And had he not known who I was, I don't think my resume experience that I had in the program with my internships, what I learned in my classes from my professors, all have served me in, in invaluable ways, and I would not have been able to navigate the career that I've had were it not for those experiences, those connections that I made at UNT. Does the city offer any for students? We do. Yeah, we do. So most departments have uh, internship programs. Mm -hmm. Some of them, for example, with Parks and Recreation or my current department, Development Services, a lot of them are discipline specific. So Development Services right now, Graphic Information System specific intern, Parks and Recreation has some Parks and Recreation interns. Um, but actually, as I was transitioning out of the city manager's office, we're working on formalizing an internship program specific to public administration students. And we're looking at departments so that public administration students can get exposure to multiple departments and then also have a foundation of what the city manager's office does as well. So those, those um, formal programs are going to be rolled out hopefully by the spring. Um, the original plan city manager's office intern right now um, and that's just been kind of a special projects position but there are a multitude of internship current internship opportunities and then a more formalized rotation program that should be coming out soon what advice would you give to our students who want to pursue a career in public what I would give is uh, public administration careers are rarely linear and something that early in my career I was guilty of was chasing titles and I thought mm must be a management analyst, must be a budget analyst, must be an assistant to the city manager. Um, but as I reached kind of my earlier on, I maybe wouldn't need to make the detours that I'm making now to get that diversity of experience so that I will be prepared to be an assistant city manager or city manager someday. I also would say with that success or city manager, if you find out that you love planning and you want to be a planning director or you want to be a planner, as long as you're feeling fulfilled, you're serving the community in the best way you can, success isn't a title. Right. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, I, I can't administration degree. I know I focused on local government, but your public administration degree can result in you ultimately working in the private sector, working in the nonprofit sector, doing emergency management. So it's not even that is not linear. You have a, a multitude of options with your to getting a business administration degree or some other specialized mm. masters. Well, thank you for joining us today, Rachel. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. All right, thank, thank you. you. And thank you, viewers, for joining us at Public Administration. And don't forget, I do have a blog, also called Chatting with Chumbler, that will help you stay up to date on what we're doing in the College of Health and Public Service. You can find it at hps.unt.edu forward slash. Also, you can join me in the Chilton Hall Atrium for Coffee with Chumbler a few times each semester. It's an opportunity to enjoy a cup of coffee with me and ask me any questions you may have about the college. It's important to me that I'm available to listen and get to know times. Visit our website at hps.unt.edu or follow us on Facebook and Twitter using at UNTHPS. Thank you again for joining us today. I look forward to continuing to show you our successes as we shape the future leaders of tomorrow. I'll see you next time here on Chatty with Chumbler as we continue to explore the College of Health and Public Service. Denton Community Television, operated by the Mayborn School of Journalism, the University.
My show is The Other Side. It runs Monday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday at 10 p.m. on Charter and Verizon. I've been really fortunate to have a lot of great guests come down here, and I appreciate everybody's time, the time they've taken to come down to the show. Joe Pat Hanford, the Larry Joe Taylor at um, the Mingus Chili Cook-Off for many years. It's a, it's a really nice event and worked with Guy Clark. His music is played on the radio in Australia, and I would encourage folks to check his music out. At 35 Denton, I met American Werewolf, a great sound, and most of the members have played in other noted bands. The drummer plays with Slobberbone. County Rexford, formed by Rex Emerson. Rex Emerson is a multi-instrumentalist who has formed Boxcar Bandits and County Rexford. I heard them at uh, the Harvest House one time it's with County Rexford as well. He did a solo show, and he's a great guitar player, great singer, great performer very talented man and has added a lot to the music scene here locally. Dunna Shea was on our show. He has a seven track his guitar, Camellia Sage. John McGee is on the art show, The Creatives of North Texas. He's a mathematician who has used mathematics to create art. He does small artwork, murals for walls and things like that. His real name is Justice Morris, his artwork on the internet. If you'd like to check him out. Christina Smith, a photographer who was completing her work at TWU, was on the show, and she uses photography to deal with family issues that we all have uh, regarding feelings of our past. She now has her first full-time professorship position on the East Coast, and I wish her luck with all of that. Matthew Gray, a noted songwriter, arranger, composer who has lived in this general area for a long time, though he travels all over the United States. He's a guy who has a musical coming out and a new album that he'd been working on for several years. And check this guy out. He's an amazing person, very talented. Ed Steele, a, a very hardworking photographer in the area who's covered many major events, Oktopia, 35 Denton, The Thin Line. He's very active in the, in the local scene and, and has captivating photography. He's, he's a true genius. Musicians use social media to promote themselves and the material that they do. And I hope as musicians that the important thing is to try to work toward harmony in the future for, for the human race, rather than so much negativity that incites violence between the various groups. And I was struck when I watched the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Felix Cavalier made a statement that he hopes that in the future people will use music in a positive way and not for evilness and not for wickedness. I've been working on children's books for a number of years and I now have two of my books on Smashwords so they are available as ebooks. Alco the Alien and Johnny the Dying is a book I wrote from a moment I had in life when I was a kid where I felt that uh, something, a being was speaking to me in the mirror when I was in the bathroom and identified itself as Alco and I always remembered that and I thought it was my throughout my life and I think a lot of people like to have something like that in their life to feel like they're being looked after by their maybe one of their ancestors or something. Johnny the Dinosaur is a book about Johnny and Johnny could be anybody, any, any human and he has, he loses his parents during a storm and then finds his dad and he and his dad eventually find his mother and I think many people can relate to these journeys that we go through in life like that and in October I put out another album, my fourth album, Spinning Out of Control. I have a few local men, Jacob Doe, and a few other people, and so I hope people will enjoy some of my songs. I mainly interview musicians. I enjoy hearing musicians and seeing them play, finding out about how they play their instruments, what motivates them, and I appreciate all the people. I don't really know too much about photography and art, but I created the art show, The Creatives of North Texas, and. Uh, have had some really great photographers and artists to come down here. And thank you so much for watching. I appreciate everybody who watches the show and supports the show. And I look forward to doing many.
I want to hear about everything the Lord is doing in your life. Or You see, when God was speaking this to Abraham, he wasn't speaking it just for the benefit of Abraham, but God was speaking this to Abraham for the benefit of God's people. God tells us in his word, he said, I will give it, but you've got to set your foot in to that new place. But you're going to have to face every giant that is standing in your way of facing success. And that's what some of you need to do. You need to cut off the head of you from moving into your future. You need to cut off the head of fear. You need to cut off the head of doubt. You need to cut off the head of unbelief and face everything, every giant that's standing in your way of moving into that new door, the door of opportunity for you to open. He promises us that He is the way, He is the truth, and He is the life. And there is only one way to the Father, and that's through the Son, Jesus Christ. Pastor of First Baptist Church in Dallas and Bible teacher on Pathway to Victory. I hope you'll consider supporting Time with Teresa, a wonderful broadcast ministry by contacting Teresa at the information you see on your screen right now. God bless you. I was born in Houston, Texas, and I come from a large family. My early childhood is filled with dysfunction and tragedies, 
but I've and those tragedies as you can and turn them around into something powerful and something positive that can empower others. And it comes out no matter where I'm at, whether I'm working at uh, the, in the medical field, which I did for 10 years. In fact, I worked at the health and wellness out prior to beginning the Time with Teresa television program. I established a ministry called Pearls of Shalom Ministries. I've also authored two books and have a music video story of overcoming childhood sexual abuse. The mission of Time with Teresa is to encourage, empower, and entertain our viewers. Many times we will be talking about topics that are profound and some of the hard-hitting issues that are relevant to them. Oftentimes we will have programming that is strictly to entertain the viewers. Based on my many years of working in the ministry in the medical field, it's easy for me to get to the heart of my guest interviews and engage them in the program, talents generously, and they share their lives intimately, making for great programming. It's our hope that our viewers walk away from our programming encouraged, empowered, and entertained. I began this program about seven years ago. We have real ministries to Time with Teresa, and we've branched out from faith-based strictly to family-friendly entertainment, along with faith-based. Our target audience is the general population. When we present programming such as ending sex child abuse, uh, the different relevant issues to our world today uh, about people being addicted to prescription drugs, that is the part of our empowerment mission, to enlighten our viewers and to empower them. There's been several times I've been out in the community to say, oh, I watch your television show and it's really been a blessing to me. Uh, and then I've also heard from nurses at the hospital that they say they walk in and the patients are watching Time with Teresa on the television show. And this makes it all worthwhile for me if we can a little bit easier or educate them in a matter to help them reach a good decision on a struggle in life, that really makes it all worthwhile. And I get well, calls from people who are out of state who are planning to come to my area uh, that are requesting a television program. I'm also requested also to go film on location interviews at red carpets and different events. And that has been so exciting. In fact, that's some of the new growth that has happened with Time with Teresa this year. We have done, I was able to interview many uh, professionals from the uh, Texas entertainment industry. And I always have a lot of fun when I do these own location interviews. But this is my passion, and this is one of my calls in life. But everything that I do, it's in my DNA to share. I know what he's done in my life, and I know what he can do in others' lives. Good evening, everyone. President of the UNT Chapter of the Society of Professional Journalists. Welcome to Women with Words, Female Pioneers in Journalism. As we commemorate Women's History Month, it's important that we recognize and celebrate the very important role women have had, have played in journalism, make up more than half of the world's population. So it's imperative that, that our voices are heard and our words read when reporting on the world around us. It's also important that I and other women like me studying journalism at UNT have female mentors and role models we can look up higher to be like. We have some of those very women with us here this evening. They'll share the lessons they've learned and their stories. They've also blazed the trail before us so that we can follow behind and perhaps even travel further down the road of success. Before we get started, I'd like to highlight just a few pioneering female journalists.
to welcome another woman we can all aspire to follow, our new UNT Provost, Dr. Jennifer Cowley. Thank you, Celeste, North Texas. UNT has made great strides in celebrating and promoting the role of women in all academic and professional fields, including the women we are here to recognize and hear from this evening. In 2017, total undergraduate enrollment at UNT, and this number is even higher at the graduate level, at 60%. And women make up a large and ever-growing percentage of our overall UNT faculty, 459 out of the 1,075 faculty last year. And at the Mayborn School, women are most, um, uh, mostly female population. It's important to acknowledge that we now have our first female chancellor, Lisa Rowe, and I'm honored to serve as the provost and vice president for academic affairs. In addition, Judith Jorney, in hospitality and tourism, is our longest serving dean, uh, having served for 20 years. UNT has recently added a number of female deans, including our College of Business, our UNT Libraries, and UNT International. It is especially pleasing to note that our North recent Student Choice Awards named Mayborn's Dorothy Bland as the best dean at the university. Congratulations to Dorothy. And all of this is remarkable given that up until a few decades ago, women made up a very small percentage of our overall years. We're proud to see that UNT is rapidly growing to mirror our minority, uh, majority student population and we're making great strides in this area and we'll continue to push even harder in the near future to ensure that our university looks more and more like the communities that we serve. With that, I'd like to welcome you in Sue Mayborn School of Journalism to say a few words. Thank you, Provost. Cowley. What began as an oral history assignment in one of Dr. who largely pioneered journalism and abound in the Dallas area and far beyond. These oral histories are archived in the Portal to Texas History at our Willis Library just across the courtyard. We are especially pioneering women have ties to the University of North Texas and even better to the Mayborn School of Journalism. At this time, I'd like to ask all students, faculty, and staff of the Mayborn to please stand. Let's celebrate each of you and our diversity. You all deserve a terrific round of applause. We are tremendous, you can have a seat now. We are tremendous of our student leaders at the Mayborn, from the presidents of our student organizations to the editor of the North Texas Daily, to our leading award winners and scholars are young women. You are already making a tremendous difference and we are extremely, let me say that again, extremely well shared a few numbers that highlight the importance of women in our family. Tonight, we are here to celebrate pioneering women female journalists. These are women who have played and continue to play important roles in shining the light of journalistic truths and helping to strengthen our democracy. While we are making great strides in the field of journalism, there is far more work to be done. And I'd just like to share with you a few statistics. Did you know that women make up 47% of the total U.S. labor force, yet leadership roles in almost all areas of government and business? According to the Pew Research Center, the gender gap for women is real. Recent studies show that women earn 83 cents for every dollar men earn for doing the same jobs in the United States. Yeah, I'd cry about that too. Thank you. In the working world of journalism, you, the next generation, have an opportunity to help us continue to push even further. Women currently make up only 32% of the typical newsroom today. Sir, of the Women's Media Center says that the percentage for women of color is even more dire, and I can testify to that truth. They say that journalists write the rough first drafts of history, and so it is increasingly important that women play a role in chronicling who we are as a history drafters. Beyond this, we're documenting Women's History Month by celebrating many other pioneering journalists. Across the plaza at the Willis Library, we have installed a special exhibit that features the profiles of journalists. The exhibit will be on display until April 10th up on the second floor of the Willis Library. 
So I encourage you to stop by and help us carry the celebration forward. Do you happen to have a favorable story of how females in the media have made a difference? That's great. We want to hear about them. Please share those highlights with us at hashtag Mayborn Women with Words. Let me say that again. Hashtag Mayborn Women with Words. That the Mayborn's associate professor, Dr. Tracy Everbach, who also leads the UNT Women's Faculty Network and our distinguished panelists can give us some insights into the work that has been done and the work that remains to be done. I'm reminded of something that Gwen Eiffel, my friend, and in that is change comes from listening, learning, caring, and conversation. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Tracy Everbach to introduce our panelists and lead this evening's discussion. Dr. Everbach? Hi, thank you for coming. The Women With Words project began in 2012 in a graduate level class that I teach. Um, students were assigned to find women who had made a mark on Texas journalism and media and conduct oral histories on their lives in the 19, late 1980s and in the 1990s. Others were recommended by friends and acquaintances and some the students found on their own. Uh, we currently have 23 oral histories in the collection and four more from this past semester are waiting to be archived. Sadly, two subjects, Vivian Castleberry and Celeste Williams, have passed away since we recorded their stories. Today, we're thrilled to have four legendary Carrasas is on the program. She's an amazing writer and visual storyteller. Uh, she was supposed to be here today, but like many working journalists, she got called away to an assignment uh, in Seattle. I had to cancel, but we still have four wonderful women, Katie Sherrod, Gail Reeves, Carolyn Barta, and Leona Allen. Um, I will introduce them one by one. Leona Allen, come on out, Leona. Yay, Leona! Leona Allen, at, at the Dallas Morning News. She's an alumna of the University of North Texas where she majored in journalism and she worked as the, at the NT Daily as an undergraduate. Uh, she worked, after graduation, she worked for a community newspaper and for the Dallas Times, she used to compete on stories. Um, after, and then she worked for the Akron Beacon Journal where she was part of a Pulitzer Prize winning team that won the Public Service Prize in 1994. The series examined segregation and racial attitudes to improve communication among the community. Um, she then returned to Texas to work for the Dallas Morning News and she has been a journalist there for 24 years. Uh, we also have Carolyn Barda. <laughs> Carolyn was one of the first women in Texas to become a political reporter. She began her career in 1961 after graduating from Texas Tech University's journalism program. She worked for a short time in Hawaii, and then she joined the, um, refusing to be shuttled into the women's section of the paper, which is what they had then in the 60s. She worked her way up through the ranks as a general assignment reporter and an education reporter to cover state politics. She eventually became a national correspondent on billionaire Ross Perot and former Texas Governor Bill Clements. Um, along the way, she earned a master's in journalism from the University of Texas at Austin. And her second career was as a professor of practice in journalism at SMU, the campus where she W. Bush, yes, the former president, on campus just after his presidency ended in 2009. When he saw her, he offered to come speak to her students, and he fulfilled his promise. He came to come talk to her class at SMU. Bill Reeves, she's known to many of you as a professor here at UNT, where she teaches intro to media writing and principles of journalism. She's a longtime Texas journalist who graduated from the journalism program at the University of Texas at Austin, the Citizen, the Austin American Statesman, the Fort Worth Star-Telegram, the Dallas Morning News, and she's the former editor-in-chief of the Fort Worth Weekly. She also has a master's degree from the Mayborn School of Journalism here at UNT. Yay. Um, for several years at the Dallas Morning News and knew her as a talented investigative reporter and who was always an advocate for women 
and she was always one of my role models. She led a 1994 Pulitzer Prize winning team that won the International Reporting Award for a series on around the world. And she was also a 1990 finalist for the Pulitzer Prize for a series on hidden wars around the world. And then we have Katie Sherrod. <laughs> Katie Sherrod has worked as a writer, producer, and commentator for more than 30 years. She's been a champion for women in media, speaking out against family violence and advocating for women's reproductive freedom since the 1970s. She's a graduate of the University of Houston. She's worked as a columnist for the Fort Worth Filmmaker and appears on Inside Texas Politics on WFAA television. She wrote and produced a documentary on Freedman Cemetery Memorial in Dallas, a desecrated burial ground for former slaves transformed into a monument for African Americans. And she also worked on a documentary on LGBTQ Anglican Christians in Africa. She says her passion is to use her access to media platforms to give voice to the voiceless, the powerless, and the marginalized. So these are our panelists. Ask them a few questions, and we will leave some room for you to ask questions <coughs> for, to them at the end. OK. So now I have to find my list of questions. <laughs> OK, um, so I reviewed the oral history to Texas history. And I was struck by the fact that Carolyn and Katie, who began their careers in the 1960s, were automatically ushered into the women's sections of the newspapers where they worked. Um, at the time, women's sections focused on furnishings as well as society news, because at that time, that's what women were supposed to cover. Um, bored, Carolyn Barta tried to get out by applying for a job as a political writer and was told, you know, you can't go out onto the golf course and fill this job with a man. Are you shocked? Or no? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, she did eventually get the job she was looking for, but she had to share it with a man. Later, Carolyn was pregnant with her first child, and she was forced to quit her job because pregnant women couldn't work in the newsroom. She had to later reapply for her job and get it back. Um, when Katie got hired, the hiring manager asked her to use and asked if her husband would approve if she had to travel for work. Um, these practices must seem difficult for our students to believe. And I want to ask Carolyn and Katie, how did these experiences lead each of you to? Well, never underestimate the power of a pissed off woman. <laughs> <laughs> I was just <coughs> shocked and amazed and um, realized that the powers that be were paying no attention to what was being covered in the women's department. And they literally paid no attention. And so I thought, hmm. Well, the women's movement, the new women's movement, was just beginning uh, to gather steam. The newsroom was covering it. So I started covering the women's movement, interviewing feminists who came to town, who came to TC to speak, who came to SMU's Women's Week, remember that, and, um, and doing stories about it, and news stories, and began to build horses, and then Sissy Farenthold ran for governor, and no one was covering Sissy. I mean, the real political reporters weren't covering Sissy, so I did. And so when it became clear that Sissy might actually win a primary, which in Texas, <laughs> The editor came to me and said, you need to give all your notes on Farenthold to so-and-so. And I said, no. And I thought, I'm going to lose my job now. But I said, no, I, these are my notes. And to, as wonderful as she was, she said, I already have a relationship with a reporter at your paper, send Katie Sherrod. <laughs> and that's how I... I got to cover politics. I was still in the women's department. At least I was covering politics. <laughs> Little subversive activity. Well, I started out in the women's department, and it was not just that that's what they thought women should cover, but the, ma the male editors at the time thought that's all women were in. <clears throat> um, there weren't women working on the city desk except in maybe 
a couple of, there were a couple of things they allowed women to do, maybe general assignment or maybe education or, or health and medicine, but you could crime, police, right. um, politics. Um, and back in the 60s, there weren't any women mm -hmm. sports writers. There were no women sideline reporters. Um, there, there, there were no women in management other than the editor of the, <clears throat> so there just weren't, the opportunities weren't there then that are available to you guys today <clears throat> to cover almost anything that you are really interested in. But it took me a good long while to get, uh, <clears throat> I, I, I quit actually, I left the morning news and um, I thought I would, um, freelance my way around the world. I got as far as Hawaii and I worked there for a while. And Kennedy was assassinated, 1964. And my friend and um, they, were, uh, cut, they, they were active in the civil rights marches that were going on at that time. And, and I, you know, I looked at my life in Hawaii, which was pretty great, <laughs> on the beach and learning to surf. But it was happening back home. And I want to be part of that. I, I, so I went to, um, I came back home, I went to Washington because I wanted to learn more about government. And I got a job on Capitol Hill and I learned about politics, the making of public policy, and I said, that's what I want to do. So I went back then to the University of Texas at Austin and got my master's degree in a program called Public Affairs Reporting. So then I went back to the morning news and I reapplied and on the city desk. And so I was able to start out writing obits. And, and just gradually, it probably took maybe, I don't know, uh, several years anyway. My first really uh, good hard news beat was Sydney. I thought that was the most important thing in the world. And I still think it's important. One of the concerns I have about uh, <clears throat> what's happening in journalism today is who's going to cover community news? Who's going to cover City Hall? Um, <clears throat> at any rate, 1972, and I think that was Sissy Farenthold's year, um, I, I did say, you know, I want to cover politics. And they said, the, the, the local political beat came open a couple of times and I was passed over. And then in 72, they said, okay, you can cover a long day. <laughs> Uh, still writes politics uh, in Austin. Uh, and so we split it up. And who knows, a woman could do a good job at that. And so um, I just from there <clears throat> spent the next um, uh, three decades or so in some way either covering politics, some national politics, some state politics, uh, serving on the editorial board as Leone is now, and still writing about government and politics. Okay. <clears throat> now I have a question for Gail and Leona, who both won Pulitzer Prizes in 1994. Um, they both won the prizes for projects that focus on gender and on race. Knowing is, how difficult was it for you to convince your editors that these stories needed to be done and how did you convince them to back your efforts to do this kind of work? Well, I start, um, we were, I was <clears throat> Akron, for some of you who know, is a city of black people and white people <laughs> at that time. The white people lived in a part of time in town and the black people lived in the other. And so uh, I think this project actually started from a, the quality of schools in neighborhoods. <clears throat> and we were brainstorming ideas about how we could tell that story. And it uh, evolved into a year-long series covering not just schools, but my part of it was housing and business and long series. What was fortunate, I was in a, a good position in that we kind of gerrymandered the reporting teams. Because at that time, um, we paired a black reporter and a white reporter on each of those subject areas because it was clear, that, as they are not still, talking about race. And it was, I think, our ability to, to relate to the folks who were living where we were, who we were trying to talk to that allowed us to get the kind of information that we got from them. 
So it um, four reporters of color who were on the who were on the project and four reporter white reporters who were on the project. And so I was kind of in the lucky spot of uh, there were not many journalists of color in in Akron, but we were. It took us a while to try to figure out what was the best way to approach the story. And if we were going to get people to be frank and honest, we kind of had to gerrymander the project. And um, so it worked out pretty well for stuff from them. Um, you know, I remember things like there, we're, I'm with my partner in the car. We're going through some neighborhoods. We often travel together, though one of us took the lead on the interviews. And, you know, there's a kid on the corner, black kid, had on, you know, he uh, was sitting on the corner and she reached over and locked her door at that particular moment. And I remember we were close enough now to have these frank discussions to say, why did you lock your door just then? I don't drive around with my come out of the garage. And so we were able to have some pretty compelling, frank conversations about what was inside the reporters' heads when they cover stories as well. And so the project, we, we didn't have to do a lot of convincing, but we were had this kind of frank conversations. Well, so the Violence Against Women Project started out, I was already, I had convinced the, the people at the Morning News to let me do a, a beat, it was a halftime beat, on women's issues. Uh, and so I was already doing a great person named Pat Gaston, and she was either on the foreign desk or the national desk. And she wanted to do a project that had something to do with the worldwide status of women, but that was too uh, vague. So uh, she, she created a file in our ancient computer system that uh, where we could all drop uh, stories in, uh, ideas, things we found on the wire, you could put them in the Hey Pat file. And, uh, and so there was this co very unusual for newspapers, I think, a very, we would meet and sit around and talk with a couple of editors about, you know, how are you gonna define uh, violence toward women? You know, uh, well, is it, it, does it include killing baby girls? Yep. Does it include girls at the same level? No, we're gonna say that doesn't, that doesn't, you know, come under the heading of violence. But, uh, so we put together a proposal for this project and um, I think that pretty early on it had the management's, uh, they were gonna approve it. But I believe Kevin Merida in uh, management was the person who made it happen. Uh, and so we, we put together this outline of the project, and I remember that uh, Ann Reifenberg, another reporter, and I, she worked at the Star-Telegram. Katie, I believe, hired me at the Star-Telegram before I was at the Morning News. Um, we, and so we developed this um, theorem, or whatever we called it, and it was about, because in cultures around violence against women in some way was was culturally accepted. So our, our Reeves-Reifenberg theorem was something like, uh, uh, women may not be beaten except by, oh, virtuous married women, uh, male members of their family or their husband. Because that was like the only thing, that was all that, that the world could agree on. Everything else was, was okay in some culture or other. At any rate, so, so we did a lot of research and there was a, um, uh, there was a group of women who had started uh, the United Nations to, to uh, rec officially recognize violence toward women because they were women uh, as a human rights a violation, just the same way that uh, religious-based violence or race-based violence had been accepted as, as a, how you treated people in this, in this category, not just your own private business, okay? So we decided to craft a series of stories um, that would lead up to the time when we knew that this was considered by the UN. And um, the project team was pretty big. It was not all women. Uh, all the photographers were women. But there were um, several guys who worked on as, as reporters. Uh, but we sent people around the world. Uh, I mean, it was a small effort on the morning news' part. They invested some uh, some real capital in it, and uh, all around the world to do stories on uh, different forms of culturally accepted violence 
honor killings in India, forced prostitution in Thailand, which is what I covered, burnings in India. Um, uh, in the United States, of course, we have, you know, rape and domestic violence happen here as often or more often than in many, many countries. Uh, and so uh, that's how our series. Okay. Um, there's some issues that we've been talking about recently in media, um, such as the pay gap, um, sexual harassment movement, um, women still being minorities in newsrooms. Um, women, journalism is still made up of 37 to 40% women. Uh, the rest are men still, even though most of our students are women. Um, I'm wondering what kinds of challenges you see women still facing in newsrooms of today and maybe offer some ideas of how you think these problems could be solved. Yeah, we're going to solve them all here. Because on the editorial board, one of the things I have been able to do is to explore some of those issues in greater detail. Um, and the, the pay gap, I recently wrote a column about how women play what men make, but that women also don't ask for raises <laughs> as often as men do. And so I wrote a column about how um, important it is to have a voice, to you won't get lawyers to obviously um, do the right thing, but they're not gonna do the right thing unless you ask. And I wrote a column about how to, to do that, about a lot of profi high profile cases recently where women quit their jobs after they found out that men were. And I had about five women in the newsroom come to me <laughs> to, I had, I might as well have sat out a little shingle. I had folks coming up asking, I gave a lot of tips on what to do, do your research, try to do some market analysis, you know, salary structure for everyone, but people, tend to share some information, find some trusted sources to try to figure out where you are, um, and telling people you just have to ask. And, and sometimes you're going to be in a position where uh, you have to make you ask and they say no, and you know you're ma not making the amount of money that your colleagues are. But um, I think you, the, the issues continue. They're perpetual, and, and the numbers that we've seen recently for women and minority women, particular in to be, and I was talking to one of your students earlier about what we can do about that. And some of the things we <clears throat> discussed is trying to grow our own. I mean, women are leaving the newsroom. Women of color are leaving the newsroom. We have got to figure out a way to grow our own. That's why we have still a robust internship program at the Morning News. Most of them are women. And we, most of the women who work in the newsroom are folks who used to be interns. <laughs> and so we have to see to get more women er interested early and keep them there. I would say that one, one issue that was prevalent when I started my career in journalism <clears throat> was maternity. There, mm -hmm. there was no such thing as maternity or even <laughs> certainly not paternity paternity leave. Um, <clears throat> there was an unwritten rule when I, on my first pregnancy, there was an unwritten rule at the morning news that you could work until you were six months pregnant. And then, so <clears throat> I didn't want to quit because I needed the money. I went to the city editor and I said, look, I need to work as long as I can. We need the money. And he said, okay. And he was a very progressive editor, city editor. Uh, who was that, Karen? Bob Miller, uh -huh. married to a feminist <laughs> who was active in women's issues. Uh, <clears throat> so he said, okay, uh, just, you know, continue working until somebody notices you. <laughs> uh, somebody, somebody from the fourth floor <laughs> resided, <laughs> management. So one day, uh, one, of the, uh, one of the execs walked through the newsroom, we were on the third floor, and he noticed me. <laughs> it was hard not to notice me. I was seven months pregnant at the time. <laughs> and uh, I was gone the next day. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, the next time I got pregnant, <clears throat> um, uh, again, Bob Miller was my editor, and, and uh, he said, okay, you can, I was going to be off, I think, three months or something like that. 
And when I came back to, to work, the first time I had to wait for a job to open up that they could rehire me for. But, but I went back <clears throat> on the second time, and uh, when I showed up in the newsroom, he said, okay, I can take your physical. And I said, why do I have to do that? I've already done that. And he said, well, you were terminated while you were gone. Wow. So what it meant was I lost all my seniority. seniority. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> right. um, 20 yeah. years later, uh, we had more progressive management, and I, oh, I, I've lost several years here in seniority. Can you bridge my service? And they did it. So, <clears throat> uh, but I want to reinforce something, that, that, what, what Leona said, that <clears throat> looking back on my career, what I remember most about, you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, we didn't speak up for ourselves, and the men did. They would say, I want to do this. They would say, I want to be a managing editor. I want to go into management. Uh, <clears throat> women who worked hard and did a good job, that you would be noticed and you would be promoted. Well, it doesn't work that way. You have to advocate for yourself. And, <clears throat> and many of you, many of us, deserve a seat at the table. Oh, the other thing I wanted to say is about the maternity issue may have gone away, but still relevant are so-called family issues for women, mm -hmm. because women are still the caregivers for, ch for their children. And <clears throat> I think that a lot of newsrooms have not embraced flexibility for women who have young children. I think one of the things that is, I would also suggest the newsroom. Oh, yeah. Hugely important for you. I work for um, uh, a woman who, you know, if I needed to work from home half a day because I was trying to get to one of my kids' function, you know, get to my kids' function, one of our functions, I just did. And, and as a boss, I was a newsroom boss for a number of years, you have to model that before I even had kids, <laughs> you know. Find someone who you can talk to about, hey, I'm having this problem. I want to be at my kids' activities. I want to, I had a woman who gave me some, um, I, I, as a boss, I had mentors at the Morning News who gave me their advice, hey, at the end of the two weeks, we're all even. I get a paycheck, I put in my 80 hours, and we're even as a company, and it's okay to go home. <laughs> you have to find some people who you can talk to, who you can walk, work through these issues on. I remember, um, be, uh, my kid was long uh, through breastfeeding, but we were renovating the Dallas Morning News, the old building, and they had all this paint left over. The room where the women were supposed to nurse their babies. Good God. God bless. Today, this is the day that the Lord has made, and we shall rejoice and be glad in it. It is a blessing and a, 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 a beautiful thing to be called to be one of God's servants, one of God's ministers. Many people are suffering from so many things that cause them to lose their faith and cause them to lose hope in God. But I'm telling you, God is here today to bring you hope. The presence of God is here in this place today. My name is Pastor Daryl Bree, uh, the founder and uh, CEO of Take It Back by Force Ministries. We also pastor the Church of the House of Prayer uh, here in the city of Denton, where God is moving tremendously. God is healing people up under the sound of my voice. God is doing a wonderful thing in the midst of his people. I know what the enemy is telling you the enemy is telling you there's no hope. There is no real preacher out there today, but there is preachers out here today that you just have to have the faith and the hope and the discerning spirit to know who you are connected with. So many people are talking about so many things that's causing us to lose our hope, to cause us to not have faith in God, but God, uh, God, he's still a miracle moving God. Back in the days of when John the Baptist preached, the scripture says in Matthew chapter 11, 
and verse number 12. If you have your Bibles, let's go there. But before we go there, let's go and, and we'll pray for the word of God and we'll pray for this service. I'm just so excited. I just had to calm down in my spirit. But God is moving like never before. If you have your Bibles, go with me to Matthew chapter 11. But before you go there, let us bow our heads in prayer. Father God, we just thank you today. God, we give you glory and honor today. God, we magnify your name. We give you all the praise because we know that you are a healer. God, we know that God, we ask that you cover us under the blood today. Heal someone that may be listening to the sounds of my voice or watching this telecast. Oh uh, God, we ask that you touch that television right now. God, that you touch their home with the blood of Jesus. Move that disease out of the way. God, heal that blood pressure right now. God, move that tumor. God, move the sugar diabetes and cancer. God, we know you can do it because you can do exceedingly, abundantly, more than we ask, is move, ask you in your son's name, in Jesus' name, and every believer say amen. If you have that text, let's go to Matthew chapter 11 and verse number 12. And, it, and from the days of John the Baptist, the kingdom of heaven suffered violence, and the violent take it back by force. You have to ask God right now for that power and that strength and that joy to take that thing back that the enemy has tried to steal from you, significant ones, your, your friends, oh my God, on your jobs, or God, or, or even in your church home. Sometimes people will rub you the wrong way, will cause you to lose hope and to lose faith in God. But God said that look towards the hills which cometh your help. All your help come from the Lord. All your help, I mean your healing, your blessing, your miracle, your deliverance. All God can set you free right now where the enemy tried to destroy you right there and turn it into your fame. If God will lift you above your situation. He'll make the enemy your footstool. But sometimes we get to listening and an idle mind is the devil workshop. But sometimes we'll get there and we get to listen to all the stuff that's coming from around the way and this way and that way. But we need to get down on our knees and pray and believe the prayer of faith. Because the prayer of faith will heal and set free. The prayer of faith will delay. Because I know because he done it for me. I know because I was down. I was one that was, was sick in my body. I had... Uh, 400 and something uh, count in my kidneys. Uh, I, I was diagnosed with sugar diabetes. Mother, I was so depressed. I was down. Nobody even knew it. I knew how to mask myself. I knew how to uh, 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 act it out. In other words, I could have won a Grammy or an Emmy or an Oscar or something because I knew that uh, I didn't want any. But God knew that I was hurting. God knew I was broken in my spirit and that's the one thing when God can use you at the most the greater he he can use you greater when you're at that point and I know that some of you many of you come right in and set you free God can help you take it back by force oh you just have to tell the devil no you have to tell the devil that I'm going to get my healing I'm going to get my breakthrough I do what he said he would do just like he promised he would. There in the book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 16, he said that a factual greater door has opened. And I tell you in 2000, open for you, just like he has opened a greater door for me. God opened a greater door for me to step in and step through. Oh, I was a little nervous. I was a little scared. But God hadn't given us the spirit of fear, but a power, love, and a sound in us, his Holy Spirit, his Holy Ghost, that we're able to leap over obstacles and mountains. Oh, we're able to run through uh, uh, troops and uh, and jump over hurdles and everything but you got to have that power that anointing that destroyed the, that in those days it was the only the anointing 
that destroyed the yoke. We're so tied up on images and we're so tied up on who knows who and we're so tied up on our intellect. But God is looking for that vessel. God is looking for that as the anointing of God that will help destroy the yoke of bondage, the yoke of sitting in a rut, depressed. Some are depressed and suppressed. Uh, some are set in their own ways where they're shipping with anybody else because of what has happened in the past. But there, my God, my uh, beloved, you're going to have to get rid of what you have been through in the past. Paul said, forget those things which are behind me, and I press towards the mark. Tears in my eye. I'm pressing because I'm hurt, but I know that we've been making do for a night, but joy come in the morning. Joy coming. How many is looking for that joy? That joy of what I'm going through. I'm tired of even talking about the things I'm going through. I'm talking about I want to be in the place where there's unspeakable joy. There's peace surpass all understanding when Paul wrote there in Philippi in the, in the Philippi that God has given him peace past all understanding that type of peace uh, no matter how the bills are due no matter what I'm going through but I still have that joy unspeakable joy because I'm seeking God for that joy. And when you begin, beloved, to seek God in that matter, in, in that way, God will do what he said he would do. Just like he promised. Because he's not a God that he shall lie. Neither the son of man spoke it. Then he'll say it and he'll make it good. I'm looking for God to make it good in 2018. I'm looking for God to show up in my ministry like never before because I've laid aside a whole lot of stuff that I thought that was about God. But, and I'm telling you, if you do that, if I double dog dare you, if you do that, God will step in. God will do exceedingly, abundantly, more than you can ask or thank him. Because in those days, the enemy was doing so much in what he is doing right now. God, hey, God is not worried about no gun laws. God is worried about souls and people. People have to allow God to come in and transform the renewing of their mind. So much evil is taking place. You either for good or you for evil. Which side are you on? I want to be on the Lord's side. I don't want to be like where the leader of the children of Israel in the book of Joshua said, why must we stand here amongst two opinions? I'm going to serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Own house. That's the sovereignty of our God. Our God allows us to be, to serve him. We don't have to sit up there and worry about what my friend is doing and what this one is doing. The way to hell is broad, but straight and narrow is the gate. I want to be where I give an account to God. I want to be in the midst of folks that saying, hey, I know you sick, but let's get together and let's pray. Even in high places, we're fighting against wickedness in high places. We're fighting against principalities and everything. But if we put on the whole armor of God, we put on that helmet of prayer of righteousness and I gurney up our lawns and our feet preparation with the shield and the spirit, which is the word of God. We need the word of God today. Romans chapter 10. Let's go to Romans chapter 10. We're going to settle this thing that we're in and where we're facing. We're in the season of deception, but the word of God is sure. It's, sure. it's written. That's what Jesus, the enemy came to him and tried to take him up to that high mountain and said to him, cast yourself down. Said man should not be uh, lived by bread alone but by every word that come out the mouth of God. Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says that, so then faith cometh by hearing, 
and hearing by the word of God. We've heard so much, but we've heard the word of what I'm speaking to you do today. Have faith in God. Have faith in God's word and have faith in God's people. Because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. I know what the doctors told you. I know what that, that walked out in your life. But I'm telling you that no man have left mother, father, houses, or, or land that God won't give back to him in this lifetime. I don't want that old stuff. I want something new. I want the newness of God. I want God so that I can be able to, to maneuver and renew my mind. I want that spirit of God that God will take me to higher obstacles and higher levels that I can be able to speak to the nation and tell the nation that faith cometh by what he said he would do. Just like he promised you. The devil would try to tell you, no, God ain't going to do it. God ain't going to heal you. God ain't going to bring you peace in your heart. You're going to always thank you. God can move mountains. He can move valleys. He can bring valleys up. Brighten your day by watching Time with Teresa television show. Whether in the studio or on location, Teresa Westbrook and guests will warm your heart and encourage your soul. And now your host, Teresa Westbrook. Well, welcome to the program. We're so glad that you've tuned in. And uh, we are here on location at the Gainesville Civic Center. And we are here with our friend, Mary Faye Jackson, who is the president of the Texoma Gospel Music Association. Wonderful artist tonight and worship music and singing and talents that are here tonight, and musicians. And uh, we're going to be rolling in a few of the songs so we can share that with you tonight on the program. So we're so glad that you've tuned in. Be sure to share this program with all of your friends. George Washington, Abe Lincoln faced difficulty, prayed to God, creator of liberty. Our founding fathers credence gave to sovereign God Almighty. The would they pray, restoration to the nation. A freeman goes today with just cause to protect the USA. A soldier gives his life so we can live a sacrifice. Pray. Turn from our ways, seek his face, ask for grace. Turn from our ways, seek his face, ask for grace. Red and the white. Well, hello, and look, 
who I have with me tonight, Miss Mary Faye Jackson. Hello, and Teresa, and all the great members of Texoma Gospel Music Association and a lot of our attendees that are here from about 13 different states. And uh, we're having a great time in Gainesville, Texas. That's right. And I, we're so glad we're here on location. Time with Teresa is here yeah. on location. And we so much, Teresa. And uh, Teresa Westbrook happens to be our director of media. And we're so excited. We believe that God is taking Texoma Gospel Music Association to some new levels because and media. Yes, and, and uh, it's just a blessing and an honor to do what little bit that I can, Mary Faye. Mary Faye and I go a long ways back. We've been friends a long time. And, you know, and there's there's not many months difference in our age, but I told her, I said, Mary Faye, this is going, it started at 10 a.m. today, and it goes to 10 p.m., and then last night it started at what time? 6.30 to about 10. 6.30 <laughs> to 10 last night, and she's still holding up, and we're doing interviews. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm telling you, when the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, you just you have a supernatural energy. And I, I've been like you. I've been blessed by so many of the singers and the songwriters. And, and it's just good to be with God's people. This has truly been a gathering. Because yes. Paul is the president of Texas Gospel Music Association recently, right? As, oh, sorry. Texoma Gospel yeah. Music Texas Association. Texas and Oklahoma. Okay. But we've included all states. So. Okay. And so now you're just, is this going to be like an annual event, Mary Faye? We have talked about having two or three in a year, oh. <laughs> but moving it to different locations. We'll just see how the Lord leads. When God's in it, it's going to work. Yes. And it's going to, we've, we've had probably, I don't know how many members, singers, songwriters, authors, poets. Mm -hmm. um, it's amazing the people that God is bringing together with us. Yes. Well, now, uh, real quickly, I want you to tell about that beautiful event that happened today where y'all oh. honored the veterans. Tell the viewers what they missed on that. Wow. It, um, a friend of ours, Dwayne Farrow, which is a member and a board member of Texoma Gospel, he uh, sung a patriotic song, and we had all the veterans that were here to come and stand in front. And then we had each one to tell their names and when they served. And it was like the Spirit of the Lord just came over the place and I, I think there was tears all over the building and, and and thanks we wanted to thank them and I know some of the veterans came up to me and said thank you for honoring us because some of them didn't get the honor they needed when they came back from this it's been a an uplifting event not only for us but for veterans and uh, maybe we can figure out some way to include our veterans in the Texoma we need to have a uh, a special dedication every time to the veterans, I feel like. I believe so too, Mary Faye. I, I really do. We we the freedom that we have in this country to come and gather and do these events and we don't know how much longer we're gonna have this freedom, but we're gonna fight for it. We're gonna fight to keep it, aren't we? Praise God. Well real quickly give a shout out to some of your sponsors. Oh wow, there's just been so many. We've had hair from Colorado and uh, so many of the local newspapers and, and media that have got, jumped on board and helped us to uh, spread the word about this event. And it's growing, and people are giving to this ministry. Mm -hmm. uh, Praise so God. I know God's in it. And we ask for you to bring into Texoma Gospel Music Association. Get in touch with Teresa. Oh, get in touch with Mary Faye. <laughs> Either one of us. Either one of us. Or, or any board member yes. would be great. So. Well, Mary Faye, thank you so much thank for spending a little time with us. You're doing an awesome job. It's a beautiful thing. I've got a man that brings every day. He's never too busy or very far away and I can call midnight noon or break of day I've got a man that brings me roses every day oh roses there's none to compare of all the flowers God's created, the sweetest fragrance in the air. And it adds so much.
I've got a man that brings me roses every day. I've got a man that brings me roses. He's never too busy or very far away. And I can call on him noon or break. Of day, I've got a man that brings me roses every day. Now, when I get to heaven, I'll bow before his grace. And I'll meet my Prince Jesus Then face to face I'll thank him for his love And for brightening up my days I'll meet the man that brought me roses I've got a man that brings me roses Every day He's never too busy, far away. And I can call on him at midnight, noon or break of day. I've got a man that brings me real day. I know the man. Well, welcome back, and I have with me now Mr. Marty. All right, yeah. well, how awesome to have you, and we're here at the Texoma Gospel Music Association at the Gainesville, Denton, uh, the Gainesville Civic Center, and it's a delight to meet you tonight. Tell our viewers themselves. Well, thank you. It's good to meet you, too, and great to be here at the Gainesville Civic Center. The website is heavenscountry.com, and we play Christian country music, so you'll hear Mary Faye Jackson and a lot of the artists that are here today you'll hear on the radio station. We run 24-7 and you can tune in on the free app, hear some great gospel music. We're heard worldwide. And then during the week, in the mornings at 6 a.m. Mountain Time, um, that's O-Dark 30 for those in Texas that don't want to get up that early. <laughs> it's, I'm on for an hour on Facebook Live and you can come join us. And you get to, So I do some weird news of the day and some funny stories and, and play a lot of music. So it's a great time. Awesome, awesome. And so you're here getting interviews with some of the artists yes. here at this event, Yes, correct? we are, yeah. We have a booth in the back that uh, we have. When you get with them one-on-one, -on -one, like we are now, you, you get to talk to them and hear from the heart, and they share things that somebody in the audience is listening going, I needed to hear that. And our prayer is that as you're walking, the Lord will use us for that we can say they will bless you and touch you in a mighty way. Absolutely, and you know I love that, that the ministry is the heart behind all of this. Amen. Not just the platforms for the talent mm. and uh, the glamour and glitz, but there is really a heart for ministry, yeah. and I just love that. Any of God. That is. And you know, God gives us the passion to do what we do, to lift up His name. And, and what a privilege it is to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, the one who died for you and I, the one who gave His life for us so that we can... He's why we sing. He's why we do what we do. And your TV show and, and the internet radio station is because of him. Without him, we're nothing. Amen. Amen. Well, now, I know that y'all are noticing this smooth voice. <laughs> <laughs> so you make her come see. And I'm sure you have other talents. Do you sing as well? No. Uh, if I sing, my dogs run with their tail between their legs. So we don't do that. Um, my full-time job, I am an EMT by trade. So I spent years working in emergency. Now I run a lab and x-ray, Indian tribe in Colorado. But the uh, the radio station I keep running because it's what God's called me to put out there and it's my passion to 
get the message out. And so when I'm not there, I'm working the radio station to make sure that it stays on the air and that it's playing the music. Well, what a delight to meet you tonight. Well, thank you. God bless you, and I'll look forward to seeing more great things come out of your radio station. Well, thank you so much. The Lord has lined up for you. God bless you, my friend. Thank you so much. Yes, sir. God bless you. Well, it's my pleasure and delight to introduce you to the Executive Vice President of Texoma Gospel Music Association, Mr. Bill Baker. Welcome, Bill. Well, how are you, Teresa? I'm doing pretty good, thank you. Thank yes, ma'am. To hear all about you and what you've been doing, and uh, you've been helping host this great event, doing a great job emceeing. And also singing some amazing songs, Thank even you. original songs, Thank and you. playing the guitar. And so you'll definitely, we're hoping we have some of your songs rolled in. This is Gospel Music Association and how you came to be part of it and, and what they can expect to be becoming a member of it. You know, the long and the short of how I become a member of it was Mary Faye Jackson called me. <laughs> and she said, hey, you can be on the board. And the next thing I know is she says, I want you to be my executive vice president. And I was like, hold up. But anyway, here I am, and uh, I love Mary Bay, and she's helped me a bunch in this business and, uh, with my own music, my own career, so how can I really afford it? It's been very rewarding. I've met a lot of good people, myself and, and several others that are on the board and different things, and uh, you know, this event is more of a fellowship event. We're, we're about uh, the artists being able to come together and sharing one another, you know, needing prayer, needing lift up. Maybe somebody among us has got a physical need, you know. Uh, maybe somebody's going through something in their ministry, and I will say this, I am a pastor too. And you, when you go through things sometimes in the music ministry, it's things that are And so it's good to have your brothers and your sisters that got your back, so to speak, and can pray for you. So the fellowship of this thing is, is the resounding thing that the artists continue to talk about the whole time we've been here. You know, uh, we're not giving any awards, at least not this year. You don't have to give those in your past and they're just so deserving of it. And, uh, but, but we're not so much award driven as we are fellowship driven and ministry of, ministry to the ministers, so to speak. And uh, so the fellowship of it is, is a great thing. Yes, that it's it's music and it's talent and it's worship and it's fellowship. But you haven't left out prayer for the needs of your members, and you welcome the presence of God to come in and to pray for whoever has the right. need. I love that. I love that about this. In fact, today that she met is her first time to come to this event. Of course, your first event with right. Mary Faye. And how she met so many wonderful, sweet people and that they've been enjoying it. So uh, yeah. just welcome the viewers to come on out and uh, tell them just a little bit more about you. Now, you, you're a minister, but it's two or I do. Uh, as for my job, uh, I'm county commissioner in Oklahoma. Okay. Uh, it's what I do. But, uh, you know, hey, if, if you enjoy good gospel music, maybe you just like to hear it. We don't charge the admission at the door. Uh, and... All our artists are approachable, and you'll see some of these people. In, we got Hall of Famers in there, Buddy and I, uh, Marty Smith, Mary Faye Jackson, uh, and there's others in there that are too. We have uh, folks here that have been vocalists of the year. You know, we've got uh, Heather Thomas Band there and Joy Rob songwriters in here, Jane Carter. Uh, so, so we got a lot of good things here to offer you. And uh, if you are a singer and you're looking for fellowship, uh, there's a lot of people here with a wealth of knowledge, and I myself have benefited from it. If you're an artist that's looking to go to the next level, uh, this is a great place to come just to just to get with people that are not going to charge you something for what they know. They just want to pour into your ministry so that you can go back and you can pour that into the people that you minister to as well. So we got something both for the folks that, that you know offer a great time for people that are just wanting to... Uh, enjoy good gospel music. That's right. People come and enjoy, just kick back and enjoy some great gospel music. Or if you're like me, you like to do on location interviews. Yeah, there you go. Radio or media. Nobody will tell you no. I promise you. Myself, you know, I'm a singer-songwriter. And when I came in, you know, 
I didn't know how to get songs out or anything else. Uh, and in the last oh, five or six months, I've got uh, three different songs that other people are going to cut. I, as a matter of fact, today I was telling somebody about a song. What kind of people these people are? So, yeah. so uh, tell the viewers how they can find out more about you. Uh, you can go to country316.com or you can uh, find me on Facebook at Bill Baker. The 316 with a semicolon just like John 316. You can find me on Facebook there. You can view my latest video, Grace 100 Proof, uh, on YouTube. You just type in Bill Baker, Grace 100 Proof, and uh, it'll come up. And uh, that, that video, by the way, 10,000 plus Facebook views and over 800 YouTube views. We've got response from people all over the place about how it's impacting lives. But our big thing was we believed every time it was shared, someone would get saved. It's been shared. If your faith is what you say it is, you've got to believe that over 400 people have come to know Jesus Christ when they've seen that. So, That's the motive behind it. Absolutely. If you ain't about soul saved, if, if it ain't about soul saved, I really ain't about it. Yeah, so, awesome. Today, great to be here. Thank you for having me, I'll Teresa. More great things. God bless you. God bless you. Bye now. God bless you. Kick us off. Okay. Two, three, four. A bottle, no country dance tunes, it's true what they say. The nightlife ain't a good life, but it was my place to hide in the darkness. The help on a bar stool, reading captions on a TV. It was like they were talking about me. And the silence was sudden, praying the night that I found the Lord. And I turned off the Jim Beam and turned on John 316, traded for a new, no longer. Did I ever live this long? But God had a purpose. He had a time planned for my life. In spite of me, he saved my soul. And he forgave what I could never forget. I got something else I'd like to talk to you about.
Soma Gospel Music Association. The next gathering is coming soon. Be ready, and you're going to want to come. This has been a great time. We've had a lot of fun, and we would love to see you here the next time. So get ready. Look on the screen. Right here, right here. Where they go, because this is going to be great. And thank you so much for those that have come. Thank you for when you're coming. Can't wait to meet you at the next Texoma Gospel Music Gathering Association. Well, it's been an awesome time here at the Texoma Gospel Music that you enjoyed a lot of the great singing that we were able to offer you on this program and some of the interviews that we were able to offer you on this program. So be sure to go check them out or check my friend Mary Faye Jackson out or be sure to check out TeresaWestbrook.com and see what all I mentioned and with the Music Association. God bless you. Thanks for watching Time with Teresa. For guest and sponsorship opportunities, contact Teresa today. Denton Community Television, operated by the Mayborn School of Journalism, the University of North Texas. Hello and welcome to The Good Life Show. My name is Beverly Fells Jones. I am an author, speaker, and your host. You know, this show is not about the lifestyles of the rich and famous, but it's about the ordinary and the extraordinary. And each show, I am bringing to you people who are doing awesome and wonderful things is kind of start our program off with an idea about what is this thing called the good life. You know, the, the good life can be anything. It can be, as I've mentioned before, just go in and getting your nails done once every couple of weeks. Be yourself each and every time you do that. Are you a gardener that loves to go out and sometimes get really frustrated because you've got those worms that are eating your, your leaves, but you love being a gardener and you know a good life? Are you spending time with your family and enjoying each other? That's the good life. So I found this pro poem online and I want to read it to you. And it was written in 2007 by a gentleman by the name of Simpson. That's all he's got, E-A-S, whatever that stands for, but I want to give him credit. He says, life is good. Life can seem ungrateful and not always kind. Life can pull at your heat strings and play with your mind. Life can be blissful. Life can put beauty in the things that you see. Life can place challenges right at your feet. Life can make good of the hardships we meet. Life can over overwhelm you and make your head spin. Life can reward those determined to win. Not always fair. Life can surround you with people who care. 
Life clearly does offer its ups and downs. Life's days can bring you both smiles and frowns. Life teaches us to take the good with the bad. Life is a 